Okay. Well, hello and from the rooftop of Valia's Market, and welcome to Plugin Along, a stream dedicated to Lotro plugins. Last time on Plugin Along, we added a text countdown showing number of seconds left on the 100 deadly decoy, and we also fixed how scaling works and added an option for the plugin size, how big it looks on screen. Uh, and this time we're going to go back and localize the changes we made last week, which makes them easy for someone to come in and translate them to French and German, uh, and figure out what else we can fit into the next release, which I would love to push out today so that any hunters out there can take advantage of what we did last week and today. Uh, as always, feel free to jump into chat with your thoughts and questions. And first, let's go ahead and review what the Hunter Deadly Decoy can already do. Let's see. So we have Arda here, my trusty hunter over on Treebeard. And Arda's going to go ahead and make sure she has the Hunter Deadly Decoy plugin enabled. So uh, it's already shows 101 because that's the version I'm developing, but 100 is the version that's released out into the world. All right, so I've loaded it up. If I didn't have it, remember that it's quite easy to install plugins with the Lotro plugin compendium. I'll go ahead and drag it over here. All right, so the Lotro plugin compendium is a very nice way to go ahead and add new plugins if I wanted to add say the reminders plugin by Thorolore. I can just type that in, hit this, go ahead and add it. And Lotro plugin compendium is taking care of downloading it, installing it in the right place. Hey, Charles. So uh, we have the 100 of the decoy. 100 of the decoy plugin is gonna detect whenever we release a decoy. And here it is on the screen. Remember that we can go ahead and change the size. That's what we were doing, working on last time. And it tells us when that's going to blow up, which is just delightful. We can also move the window around. I'm going to go ahead and move it up here. So maybe it's a little bit more visible. How about right there? And we'll lock that back into place. <laughs> Shoreless has been on Treebeard, the slower of legendary servers, a lot this past week in the mad rush to 50 before draw, bra Brawler drops. Do you need to be 50 before Brawler drops, or are you just going to switch to Brawler exclusively? <laughs> okay, so what, what did we do last time? Last time we did the scaling bit, and we can see that there's actually a bug with the scaling. If we look at that health bar, it's not changing length. Uh, I don't know that I worry about that too much. Uh, it does reset itself. If we go ahead and do this and then deploy that to the decoy, it's right. Yeah, so it's only a preview issue, but it's always good to note our bugs. So let's go ahead and pull up our code window. In this case, I'm just using a normal text editor, Sublime Text. Whatever your favorite editor of choice is, is fine. So we're going to come into plugins. Mine are in cube plugins. Hey, it's me. And then Hunter Deadly Decoy. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and open up our to-do files where we can store things. Now, did I already write it somewhere? No. Okay. So, bug. Health bar does not scale during preview. Wouldn't that be nice if it did? And let's go ahead and pull up our readme file. So, here's what we've done so far in version 101. You know what? We should at some point add like a thanks section to all of you awesome people who have given such great ideas. Ah, Than says I'll definitely be rolling a Dwarvish Brawler. Hmm. Why not a Hobbit though? I hear anyone can be a Brawler. Imagine a raid of 12 Hobbit Brawlers taking on Karn Doom. Well, I'm definitely making a Hobbit brawler because uh, I like Hobbits, and apparently Hobbits can be brawlers uh, on Treebeard, so I can get my brawler titles. That way lies madness. No, no, no. That way way lies awesomeness. Okay, so here's what we have done so far. Let's go ahead and figure out what we're doing today because I'd like to go ahead and uh, publish an update so we can see what that looks like, uh, remind ourselves what it's like to publish an update, and also to get it out there. Oh, and we do have an errata from last time. 
Last time, I was pointing out how to add things to the Lotro plugin compendium. Let me go ahead and open up a browser window here. Now, if we go to uh, Lotro interface, and let me make that bigger, and Lotro plugin compendium. The Lotro plugin compendium by Lunar Water. I was noting that uh, there were several requests here in chat, uh, but I hadn't seen uh, Lunar Water uh, respond to them. Oh, wow, there's been lots of chatting. Has that been recently or am I on the wrong one? I might be on the wrong one. Hang on. There we go. This one. Okay. Uh, that is a source of confusion for Lotro interface. Uh, there are, can be multiple things named the same. So I was noting that there were a couple uh, requests that had been put into chat here. Uh, and I hadn't seen a Lunar Water respond to them. I figured they were on summer vacation. But those requests have been serviced, um, or at least these two have as of last week, uh, and they are in the Lotro plugin compendium. There just wasn't a comment here saying, we did it. Uh, so, oh, hey. Exo <laughs> uh, says, why publish updates when you can release it as an entirely new plugin? Um, well, uh, I guess it depends on how different it is. Like if I had a um, plugin here that was just all about the deadly decoy and nothing else, and then I added so many new features because now it supports traps and now it supports this other thing and now it's this other thing, like at a certain point, enough changes in functionality equate to a different plugin. But, ta, ah, excellent. Okay, so that was, uh, you caught me. I did not realize that was a joking question, but yes. So at a certain point, you may want to release it as a new plugin, but pat, uh, updates are great. Uh, and if you are writing a patch that's different than publishing a plugin, that is true. Uh, so yeah, uh, Exo says there's got published in five minutes. That's awesome. Let's take a look. Aras, so if I do a new one, Aras, great. We can see it is in there, lovely. So. Uh, I had assumed that Lunar Water was just on summer holidays or something, but they were just stealthily adding these things as the requests came in. It's super awesome. So I just wanted to call that out. Um, the final arbiter of whether something's been added to the Lotro com plugin compendium is Lotro plugin compendium. Don't worry about it if you don't see a forum post. Cool. All right, Dan will be lurking while playing games. Awesome, well, why would you not play games? Have fun playing games. Excellent. Okay, so, um, where are we? Nope, I need to fix that. Okay, so that was a piece of Reddit I just wanted to call out um, at the beginning here, clarify some things I had said last time. Um, all right, so really this is a terrible system, but it's really just places I throw my notes of things to, to look at. And so I thought we might just glance through here and see what things sound like a good idea to implement. Uh, and here's one I really like um, from the minstrel, uh, minstrel buffs uh, patch that I did. So, whoops, apologies, I didn't mean to tear that off. So for 2021, 10.05 today. We'll go ahead and change the color of this bar when it gets down, uh, when we uh, go to the um, tenths precision counting down. I think this bar should also turn red as a, oh, it's close kind of visual reminder. Get your attention. And then, of course, bam. Cool. Okay. Um, dun -dun -dun. I had talked about um, using just the, uh, we're using decoy versus a deadly decoy. I had talked about um, actually having the icon match the skill. Uh, I'm not too worried about that today, but it is something that I would like to do. So maybe, all right, scaling scroll bar looks like. Okay, we were, uh, we were thinking about being reactive if the uh, screen resolution changes. I think right now it's only reactive if you were to load the plugin after changing resolution, but not when it changes. So, respond to screen resolution change. Destiny 2. I've heard things about Destiny. Not a lot though. What did I hear? First person shooter MMO kind of thing? 
Let's see. Now, uh, there's all sorts of bugs that I introduced by the way I do the unlocking and unlocking. Oh, hello Raiders from a different channel. Welcome to Plugin Along, a stream about Lotro plugins or Lord of the Rings online plugins. Okay, um, excellent, welcome. So today we are working with the Hunter Deadly Decoy plugin, which gives you a visual representation of how long your Deadly Decoy has to last, uh, and if it's being hit upon, uh, how much health it has left in its bar. And hopefully that lets you uh, be more aggressive about pulling mobs off if it's dying too fast, or pulling mobs over if it's about to die and explode, that kind of thing, whoops. Okay, and we were just looking at what other things to do today before releasing the next patch. Okay. Neat, neat, neat. I am interested in trying this radial cooldown idea. So if we can, that would be a neat uh, visual uh, effect. Nope. Oh. All right. Uh, dun -dun -dun -dun. Yeah, there are a number of bugs um, related to, or a number of places where I don't have, like how it looks when, I, when we have unlocked the window and it is running at the same time. Uh, it just doesn't, uh, the two don't uh, correlate very well. And I, I think there are better ways to do it. Um, and so we can see I summoned out the decoy and it didn't work. But if, I, if the decoy is out first and then we unlock it, then it's okay. So the way the way uh, and but then if we relock it, then it hides. So we need a little bit more state tracking to fix that up. Whoops! I need to stop opening up new windows. Fix lock system. I think I think we should go ahead and make that better. Uh, uh, and we can wrap this little bug fix in there. Cool. Well, any, uh, any other ideas of things to do or anything that I'm not seeing in here, let me know. I'm just gonna reorganize the to-do list here and then we'll get started. Okay, um, this was a conversation we were having about epic battles and how scaling affects um, the health of the deadly decoy, which is only based, as far as we can tell, on the level of the hunter when the, the hunter summons the decoy. Ooh, I like that. Let's see if we can get that in there as well. Okay, while in options, debug, toggle, turn off, target, change, spam. So still in here, and I notice it, but no one else does, is when we change targets, there's a bunch of, um, of debug output from the uh, plugin. And while I think it's useful to have it there, I want a little checkbox here where, where you can opt into it, even in debug mode, it's like not always there. Okay, that seems like more than enough to keep us busy today. The rest of this will be later. Okay. Exo says, could reduce tick rate by making a custom event that pings at X intervals rather than every frame if you wanted to boost performance. Uh, a bit more relevant. Absolutely. Um, in our case, let me go ahead and open up uh, in here. I said open, there we go. So in our dot update function, we absolutely uh, could be a little bit more cautious about this because assuming the time hasn't expired, then we do go through this every time, even though we're only really caring about 10th of a second precision. Uh, and so all thing that we could do is say else if, um, you know, current is greater than last updated plus 0 0.1, like this is pseudocode. 
um, where we could just save off, when was the last time that we updated the UI? And if it hasn't been more than a tenth of a second, then we're not gonna see anything useful there. In fact, I like that idea. Let's uh, let's go ahead and do that because a performant plugin is a more likely to not be uninstalled plugin. So, um, all right. I'm gonna go ahead and copy. We'll just save off last update time, compare first, then do stuff. Okay, so what does that mean? What are we looking at when we see the current time? Well, that's a good question. And to answer it, we're gonna go ahead and just do something you should not do, um, which is, well, you should definitely should not write it out every time we're in the update function, but what we can do is just a little trick. So self dot timer control dot has debug happened equals false. Uh, and then we can just say, if not that, then that equals true. Uh, and then we can go ahead and turbine dot shell dot write line to write out the value of current time. And that means we won't be spewing it out 10 to 20 times a second, uh, which will just make life better. All right. Bam. So uh, we can see we did get an output here, but uh, because we were throttling it back, we're not getting it constantly. And writing to the uh, console, right, writing to the, the uh, chat window is a pretty slow operation. If you have something, something that writes out dozens of lines to the chat, you will notice your client, or at least I notice my client, uh, kind of stutter until it finishes processing and then everything uh, snaps back and loads. Uh, it's, it's I, I would not do that if you were, uh, <laughs> if you didn't want to like out the client. Okay. So now that we see it, we can look at what it looks like and we can, oh, <laughs> we can't do it again because we didn't actually reset the variable. Let's go ahead and reset this back to false so that we can see it once per summoning of the decoy. There we go. And we'll go ahead and just wait the 15 seconds. I wonder if I deploy another one. Nope. That's funny. Uh, oh, because uh, because we didn't actually execute the, the time has run out code. Okay. We'll just let it do its thing. Three, two, one, zero. Okay. So we can see this looks like very convincingly like a number of seconds uh, since a time. I don't know when its epoch is, when the start of that number is, uh, but if one were curious, one could always open up their local calculator, plug in that number and say, well, if that's seconds, and if that's, uh, oops, sorry. If that's seconds, and if that's hours, and if that's days, uh, 103 days since something, all right. Doesn't seem to matter. Uh, and then we have fractional seconds. Awesome. And the fractional seconds is what we care about here. So let's undo all of that nonsense. And again, we can go ahead and we know it's gonna be something, right? We know there's gonna be code here, else if something. Um, so what do we want? We want, instead of has debug happened, uh, previous update time equals uh, and we can actually set zero because uh, what we're looking for is something that's uh, there's at least 0.1 bigger than that value and 8 billion or 8 million is going to be bigger than that. So that's a fine default value. Uh, and so if the current time, whoops, if current time is bigger than self dot timer control dot previous update time plus point, uh, 0 0.1, then we wanna go ahead, uh, I'm sorry, else if current time is greater than the previous one plus a 10th, then do all this calculation. I don't know, is that, uh, is that gonna do? Let's see. 
Okay. Now, I didn't actually put any, uh, yes, thank you, Elsa. Elsa. I'm so used to languages that put a space here between else and if that I, I just do it instinctually and then I have to catch myself and say, nope, Lua does not do that. Uh, so I didn't test any sort of performance before I started this, uh, but in general, numeric comparison is a very fast operation, even decimal numbers as we're doing here. So comparing one decimal number to another decimal number and seeing which one is bigger and adding 0.1 to one of those, these are fast operations. But um, can we convince ourselves that it's actually working? Sure, let's, let's say it has to be a second after the previous one. All right. All right, I'm not convinced that it's working. Oh, because we never update the previous update time. All right, well, that's why we test things. So we want to go ahead and set that equal to current time. Otherwise, we're not going to see a difference. Okay, there we go. Now we, we see it's taking us a full second to do each update, uh, which is uh, what we told it to do just so we could exaggerate the effect here. But let's go ahead and put it back to 0 0.1 and see what that looks like. Okay. So this is good. We're still getting about 10 updates a second, but um, if we were being called more times than that, uh, then we would skip some of those update calls. Now that being said, on my machine, when I'm uh, spitting stuff out to a console, I normally only see about 10 to 20 of those per second anyway. And so at a certain point, it, it is very um, um, computer dependent how often that's going to get called. But if it's only being called 20 times per second on my computer, then I've only really saved a little bit, right? It, now we're doing it 10 times or less instead of 20. Uh, fortunately, in this plugin, we're not doing a whole lot, but we're doing enough and we're doing some string formatting and manipulation. And we're just doing stuff that doesn't need to be done all the time. And this is totally customizable. If you wanted it to be every uh, fifth of a second, then that's a one character change. And now we can see that this is uh, not nearly as granular. Uh, it's, um, and, and especially when we get to the decimal numbers, we'll probably see, yep, <laughs> uh, skipping, uh, skipping more than 0.1. <laughs> yeah, Exodenesis points out that updating the radio cooldown is going to be different. Now, a question I haven't looked into yet is in game, there are, um, so there seems like there could be 60 ish radial positions for an overlay. Um, just if we, if we use a skill and then we count down, how long does it take? We see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, about 13 per quadrant. Um, and so I'm wondering how, how um, precise the resources are that we have available to for that overlay. Uh, but I haven't looked into that yet. All right, so we started out uh, with the idea to limit how often we were doing stuff. Uh, and one thing I meant to do while this was up was to look at the tenths of a number. We had the last one for sure. That's true. Um, now, see, if we're only updating every tenth of a second, then we are skipping those numbers. Um, and so it almost makes me want to say 0.05. Um, but then we're back to 20 times a second, which at a certain point, that may be how often we're being called. <laughs> Baz, Baz also thinks 0.05 is the sweet spot. Let's, let's take a look at those tenths of numbers as they scroll on by. I definitely see them all. So if I were gonna keep this in, and I think I will, then I don't wanna be quite point, oh, point 0.1 because the time it takes th uh, to do this is some amount of time. So we can get at most nine full uh, iterations each second. 
<laughs> okay. Um, so Exo says uh, they go with point 0.1, but they don't display that much precision. In fact, um, we're doing this here. If the time left is less than five, um, we could do something more. We could say local is precise equals uh, time left is less than five. And then we could say local update interval equals what? Um, well, we want it to be uh, 0.5 seconds uh, if, we're, if we're not being precise. So if is precise, then update interval equals 0.05. So only in those last five seconds do we really need to spin up because otherwise, um, yeah. Oops, I do need an end there, even if it's a single line. Uh, then so we can say is time left less than five. Now we'll just use is precise. Um, and then this interval here, instead of being a fixed number, we'll just use update interval. Uh, and that'll let us probably only update every half a second. Oh, I've messed something up. Look at that. Line 35, comparing a nil. What did I do? Of course. Oh, that's, that's funny. Okay. We'll need to hoist one more. And so this is a problem is the more stuff you do outside of this check for, should you be doing stuff? <laughs> the less time you're saving. It's, it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. Okay. So we're updating uh, no more than every half a second right now. And then we'll step it up once we get to the, uh, the precision uh, standpoint. Nice. Okay, Baz says, I have a variable so you can adjust, but 0.05 seems uh, the setting that isn't really noticeable in most UI updates. Do you mean that it's not throttling very much, or do you mean that it makes a smooth visual update? Oops, not new window. Okay, um, so either way, I think that's a, a nifty addition. So, uh, Update only, uh, update does not occur as often to save. Um, I mean, are we saving time? Are we saving effort? We'll just say update does not occur as often. Awesome. So let's go ahead and pull open a source control program. I'm going to pull up in fork, which is going to be a graphical interface on top of my Git repository. And here it comes. There we go. So it's taking a second to scan the repository. There we go. And we'll take a look at the local changes. All right, all sorts of stuff to the do file as we've reorganized it. Uh, and let's take a look at what else. All right. We have a readme change to track what we've just done. And then finally, we have that previous update time. Uh, we hoist out one of these lines. We have some precision calculations. And then finally, we check to see if we want to do all the rest of this. Now, this was as we mentioned, uh, mostly just for the fun of it. This is not uh, doing an overwhelming amount of work in the update function. What are we actually doing? We're setting a variable equal to another variable. Okay, that's cheap. We're doing a multiplication, pretty cheap, but it is decimal multiplication, so it takes a few more cycles. Uh, we're doing some algebra here, addition, division, multiplication. We are updating the width of a control. Uh, which could be a no-op if it's the same width as before. Uh, but either way, it is a function call, and those could be expensive. Depends how the, uh, the interpreted language does things under the covers. Uh, and then, let's see. 
We do some conditionals, that's pretty fast. A string format, that can take a little while. It's not a big string, but that's gonna be a lot more uh, instructions. And then finally, we're setting the text. And if we're in here, that text may not have changed, especially if we're running as fast as we can. So this is fine, but it's, it's nice to uh, play nice. And it's nice to have that, um, that code there or that idea of, okay, how do we throttle this back? So we're only doing tick, 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 tick. Cool. All right, I like it. On the other hand, code you don't write is code that can't break. So uh, gratuitous changing. You gotta be careful about that. All right, we'll go ahead and commit that. Take a, a snapshot of it. Oops. Um, I clicked the wrong one. Okay. Uh, and now we've saved off everything except this show debug options as a snapshot. All right. All right, Baz says it definitely skips updates with that setting. We also have to take into account a lot of output to chat slows down the plugin a lot. That's a fair point. Anytime you're you're outputting to chat on each update, you are kind of manually or uh, passively throttling the uh, plugin because of that. So a a plugin might get a lot more chances to run. Oh, you know, I'm gonna go, go off uh, topic a little bit here, but self.timercontrol.updates called equals zero. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and uh, we'll just go ahead and use this variable uh, equals that plus one. And then when we are done, go ahead and say turbine.shell dot write line uh, and write that out. Okay, and then we can just divide by 15 and that's how many times per second uh, that the function got called. Uh, and that'll give us a nice round number to you to play with. Two, one, zero, neat. Okay, so we can see we got uh, 568 calls. We'll just do a quick little division here. All right, so it was getting called about 38 times per second. Awesome. <laughs> so uh, if we're only updating every half a second uh, instead of 38 times a second, that's definitely going to save some effort, some uh, uh, take less resources for your plugin to run. If we're, we're doing 20 times a second, it's still almost half as, as many times as it could have been. So awesome. I'm glad we uh, took the opportunity to measure that. Okay, and so uh, I want to roll back what I just did. And in source control, that's really easy. We can come updates, 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 don't want it anymore, and revert that, please. Thank you. All right, throw, throw the work we just did away, go back to the previous snapshot. Neat. Well, that was not on my agenda when we started, but that was a really excellent suggestion, Exo. So thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I tend not to think of it for simple update loops, but as we just saw, it's gonna save a lot of work for that first 10 seconds. And then, yeah, half the work even uh, for the remaining five. So lovely. Uh, but we're in the code for um, less than five seconds already. Let's just jump into the next one, which is to change the color of that bar. Um, so, what we want to do is we need to figure out where it's being set initially and make sure we restore it to that uh, when we first need it. So timer control, nope. Yes, sorry. So timer control, when we first set it up, we're setting the background color. We want to see a nice color change going. Yeah. Uh, now, if, if we were being really excessive, we could have a gradient or we could uh, do uh, white to yellow to red. Actually, that sounds like a, a great idea. But um, timer control, instead of setting the, uh, the starting color of white here, let's go ahead and set it in the, um, the show uh, function here, where uh, show gets called whenever we detect the decoy comes out. And this is where we can kind of uh, default things to uh, whatever makes sense. So uh, the timer control here, we can go ahead and set the back color to white. But why don't we go ahead and just save ourselves some effort 
and let's see self dot timer control um, this uh, back color uh, start equals this and go ahead and do back color um, let's see middle warning uh, <laughs> I wanted to warning an error but that's not right um, that color uh, naming things is so hard middle and back color and we'll just go with that and I'm guessing yellow and red are both predefined so if we go ahead and instead of hard coding to white in this show if we just go ahead and set it to self dot timer control dot back color start awesome but what if instead we made a function function hunter to the decode window set timer back color because boy i'm going to need to spell function correctly um the color is really going to be all about where we are in the time so um we know how long it takes to expire and do we know what the current time is let's uh let's go back to that update function okay self so timer expire time and we have start time okay awesome You know, a function, I, I was thinking about a function, but a function I'd want to call all the time. I, I think that's that's too much. So we'll just remember, this is how we want to set the color. Uh, and then in the update, when we're already updating other things, we can come in here and say, if, you know, what do we have here? Time left is less than, oh, uh, where do we have that? then else if time left is less than something else then that otherwise that um and so we know it starts out white and so this will be um yellow and then red or you know middle and end awesome so what do i have on my clipboard Yes, that. So we want that, we want that, start, middle, end. So all we really need to know is what is this? Now, if we wanted to be really conscious about um, operations, we could not do a division each time we come in here. But the reality is, uh, we can go ahead and start with time left that divided by mm, three times two. Yeah, two thirds times two divided by three. And then that times one divided by three. Now, obviously the times one is not very helpful, but I am trying to just um, be consistent here. So we can see it, we're just doing two thirds and one third of that value. Okay, well, first of all, let's see if that works. And then second of all, let's think about if that is how we want to do it. All right, so for a 15 second timer, I would hope at 10 seconds, good, we've changed to yellow. And then five seconds remaining, we did not change to red probably because yellow had priority we checked yellow first and then only if that didn't work now red needs to happen first else if because anytime you're less than two-thirds you're automatically less than one-third uh not the other way around so let's go ahead and do that in the right order uh and then make sure that works okay so we do start out white excellent we transition to yellow at 10 uh, or a third in. And then two thirds, awesome, we're red. 
Nice. Now, we could do something very similar with a health bar, but uh, I think uh, one, one bar is fine. Uh, so we'll, we'll stick with that. Hello, Agronaut. Welcome. Okay, cool. So we're doing this one third and two third every time we're in here, which we have throttled back. But if we want to do a memory versus processor time trade-off, we could just go ahead and calculate these values once uh, instead of every time. So if we uh, come back in here to the show command, when we are either a decoy or a deadly decoy, I am B414. Welcome, or B4 for short, or cube. I can go by many names, assuming you were addressing me. Hello. So uh, we are here in the show. Is deadly is telling us whether we're just a normal decoy or a deadly decoy, and that's where this happens. But that means we can just go ahead and self dot timer control dot. Um, um, I want to just call it two thirds, but middle uh, time equals uh, ten. Uh, and end time equals five. Oh, well, that doesn't seem uh, to match, does it? Uh, yes, I think that's right. We'll see if the colors uh, match that. And then for the normal decoy, we can do the same thing, where we can do uh, middle and end. We can just go ahead and calculate these out. Uh, we do not need to recalculate them each time. So 40 seconds and 20 seconds. Although, as something we said for, do we do we think that's an appropriate thing to have 20 seconds of yellow, 20 seconds of red? Maybe five seconds of red still makes sense for the uh, regular decoy, or maybe we never go yellow and red because it's not gonna explode, right? The time doesn't matter for a regular decoy. All right, what if we say middle time is zero and end time is zero? to kind of uh, make it so it never turns uh, white. It's all, uh, sorry, it never turns yellow or red. It just stays white for a decoy. Okay, let's give that a try. So instead of times one divided by three, <laughs> excellent. Let's go ahead and say less than um, end of time and less than <coughs> Uh, middle time. All right, let's give that a try. Little Redhead has asked a question. I will get to that in just a second. I want to make sure I didn't break anything with this last change. So we're just going to see it tick down below 10, and it's yellow. Awesome. See it tick down below 5. Awesome. And it's red. Cool. We'll let that go ahead and explode. And let's go ahead and while we're talking, send out the basic dummy and okay so could you have it turn yellow or red depending on health well that's a good question do you mean the health bar itself down here um my initial thought for oh the basic dummy um yes you could do that um my thought on this plugin from the very beginning was essentially knowing when the deadly decoy would blow up because it does proportionally a lot of damage on the Treebeard server. And so that, that was the genesis from day one is I just want a 15 second timer, anything else is lovely. And so the changing color of the timer for me was about, hey, gather those things, get it around, it's about to go. And so if the health is getting low, there's not a lot you can do about that because theoretically you're already killing the things as fast as you can, right? The, the mobs are going down. Uh, you, there are some things you can do. You can try to stun them. You can try to do whatever. But um, ultimately, if the dummy is or the, the decoy is taking too much damage, then uh, it's going to die. That being said, uh, absolutely. I think there are things we could do. In fact, uh, Apparently the overlay, the cooldown overlay, you can change the color of it. So it might be kind of cool for it to reflect the danger state of the decoy. We'll get to that. Uh, for now, um, this was a cool starting point. 
Let me actually go ahead and do some damage here so we can look at that. If this thing is taking damage, whoops, take more than that. Um, you know, do we want two bars that are changing color? Uh, I, I feel like that would be confusing to have two bars that are red right here, but maybe that's just me. Maybe it would be fine because the one is ticking down by the clock and the other is doing incremental. Uh, I'll have to think about that. That's uh, probably too much um, design thought for such a small plugin, but uh, it's good to think about these things because code you don't write is super fast to write. Uh, code that you have to write takes way longer. So if you can think of something and then say, no, I don't need to do that, you've just saved a bunch of time. Mm. The red says, I can't remember which is which. Yeah, that's why I went with the solid green for the morale because it matches the morale bar of the uh, the default skin to player. I don't know about other skins, but the default skin, that's the color right there. Uh, and the white uh, ticking down bar just because uh, white's kind of a, the default color for controls uh, for uh, when I just want to see them on the screen. Uh, and then changing colors to be more pretty is uh, sort of a secondary. Okay, well, while we're thinking about that, oh, well, what about putting the timer numbers on the time bar? You know, I also thought about that. I was concerned that would be too small. Like if someone has a times one version of this, the number, the height of the numbers to be on the timer control almost feels like it would be unreadable. And, and that's okay if it's an option, maybe you just don't turn on that option unless you have uh, this thing. You know, if you've got a times three scaling, then sure, there's probably room on there. Um, so, yeah, that's, I mean, we can put the number anywhere. Though it's certainly easier to deal with scaling if it's on the image, because uh, the scaling of text in game is non-trivial. But if you put it onto something that's being scaled uh, in this way, where Lotro is responsible for stretching it, then if the text is there, then it gets stretched too. That's really nice and friendly, because otherwise that doesn't happen. Agronaut asks, is there a way to put it smack in the middle? There is actually, let's take a look at that. I, I don't like how it looks personally, but I'll show you what it looks like. So there is a set text alignment on a label. Uh, and when in doubt, we can always check out the documentation, the API documentation. So if we open that up, we come into turbine.ui label and go ahead and set set text alignment, cool. That's going to take, well, in this case, it's going to take a uh, text alignment, isn't it? Let's see. All right, so we can see it's taking a content alignment. Let's look at that. These are the options, right? So if I popped a middle center in there instead, let's take a look and see what that would look like. Um, what I noticed last time when we were doing that is that um, I didn't like... Uh, the way the number seemed to shift around uh, when we got to uh, decimal digits. See how that decimal point, or radix point, I should say, in this case it's a period, uh, was was uh, bouncing back and forth a little bit. Um, it's, a, it's a subtle thing, and it just annoys the crap out of me, right? Uh, and so... Um, it, and just, just the way, yeah, just going back and forth. And it's like, no, I can't do it. I, I don't have it in me to look at that. Um, that, yeah, I agree with you. It looks like it's not quite in the middle. And part of that might be, um, let's see, I said, set. did I say set size? I might not have. Um, let's see, what, what if we put bottom center in there? See how that looks. Okay, uh, obviously there seems to be some space around the label that's causing the uh, centering to not be quite right. Um, yeah, I just, I can't do it. So I, I just, uh, we went around sort of the box last time and tried what about bottom left, what about upper right? Uh, and this was just a place, right? Like if you wanted to be generous, you could go into the options window and just say, where would you like it? And just have a little, um, um, some, some way for them to uh, click which corner they want it to be anchored in. Um, <sighs> anyway, so uh, that's why it's not in the middle. 
and uh, text is hard anywhere. It's not particularly easy in uh, Lotro um, because there's a fixed set of fonts that you can work with and you don't have like a true type style of fonts where you can set an arbitrary size. You just have the sizes that are available. So where is that? Is that in turbine.ui.lotro.font? You bet it is. So these are the fonts that you have as a Lotro plugin. These are the fonts that you can use. Uh, and if you want something different than that, then uh, get used to uh, wishing for things because these are the fonts you have. So, <laughs> you know, you make do. Okay, uh, Exo says, I'm still debating custom numerical fonts via images. I'd recommend just, uh, you know, just use the, the built-in one until it becomes intolerable. Uh, it'll save you some time. Okay, where are we? We just did stuff, but I don't remember what. Let's check here. Okay, so the source control says our changes were to set some colors as our um, defaults here, and you could see how you could eventually replace that with a user specified color, right? Like as if that's stored in settings, then we just load it in. Uh, then this is one step closer to allowing user control over those colors. Well, that's not a today problem, but. Uh, and then we go ahead and set the appropriate color, set the start color, uh, and get those values right here. Awesome. Well, all those changes seem lovely. We didn't actually change the to-do file or the readme. We should come back and do that. All right. So uh, timer bar changes colors. Sorry, I should say deadly decoy timer bar changes colors to warn about one, uh, 10 seconds and five seconds left. Neat. And again, that's something that we have uh, hard coded in here with the, uh, the 10 seconds and the five seconds but you could easily make that a user controllable thing where the, where the user can say, oh no, I only want it to go red when there's two seconds left or I need it to be red when there's 14 seconds left because, you know, whatever. Uh, so once you have this isolated into a single spot, it's uh, pretty easy to then hoist it out into a user controllable field. That's not what we're gonna do today, but it does put us in a position to do that if we wanted to just go nuts on the options panel. All right, to do and read me. Now, oftentimes the read me message is gonna be my commit message as well because if it's good enough for the read me file, it's good enough to remind me a month from now what this was supposed to do. And that is a, can be a very useful thing. Like uh, today when I was trying to remember what did I do last week, I just went and I found the commits in here from last week and I said, oh, Right, a numeric uh, cooldown. Oh, cool, I fixed a bug. Okay, uh, cool, fixed another bug, another bug, or the scaling stuff. Uh, and I can just walk through and see each little bit of change uh, by itself. Okay. Neat. Oh, um, let's see, Exo in chat says, default fonts too skinny, hard to read in a lot of places. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's one of those things where if you provide any user customization to how big this is, like if the, the window can be dragged or uh, if they can control it, then fonts are hard. But if it's a fixed size and the, the resolution of the, of the game client doesn't matter, if it's always gonna be 500 pixels wide, then yeah, you have a lot of control and you could just do it with images, absolutely. Agronaut asks, what program are you using? This is a program called Fork, which is frustratingly generic when you're trying to search for it uh, using your favorite search engine. Just type in Fork and good luck. But um, let's see, this comes from fork.dev and it is wrapping around a Git uh, repository on my system and it uh, knows how to interact with remote repositories. So it's also that, that repository is hosted on GitHub and so it knows how to push and pull from there. Uh, really, it's doing it through the Git uh, installation, I think. But uh, I find it very useful, and I've, 
uh, don't have a very good branching structure here, but if you do have lots of commits going in with different branches and different developers, uh, it does a very admi admirable job showing you the commit tree. Oops, wrong tech click. Okay, Exo thinks Sporks are better than Forks. Well, if they ever come out to an upgrade to this program called Sporks, I will definitely be upgrading. Okay, I was introduced to that through work, but I'm using it for my personal projects too, both because getting better at using the tool is helpful in my day job, but also because I, I, I do like it. I was I have used other UIs wrapping around Git, and so far this, this one I do like the most. Um, hopefully they can avoid the trap of keep adding features and features and features until it's terrible, but yeah. Uh, it also pays the bills. Okay, let's respond to screen resolution changes. Right now, if I, um, right now, if I summon this out and then change the size of my client window, the UI doesn't change right away. What uh, it can do is if I were to unload my client, whoops, Resizing the window uh, sometimes chases it over to the other screen. So if I have uh, the scaling as uh, times seven and I unload this and I shrink the window down and then I reload it, oh, it doesn't like that. What did I do? I don't have the decoy window, line 35. Let's check that out. Oh, interesting. Start time. I mean, that should be set to something, yeah. So what's the problem? All right, I'm gonna put this back to a fuller size. Stop snapping to the other monitor, please. Oh no. Oh, you know, I think it scrolled up. That's what it was. So it was the problem. No problem, okay. So we're gonna go ahead and unlock that, move it to the middle of the screen, fix the scaling to be point, uh, four times, and then unlock, uh, unload that. Now the scaling only really cares about the width of the window. Stop it. Uh, so let's let's take a look at this. Let's load it again and launch it. Neat. So the window is about half the width and the plugin probably takes up half that. You know what? Can I take a little snip here or am I gonna be too slow? I'm gonna be too slow. All right. We'll summon it back out. I'm gonna take a little screenshot. Awesome, we're gonna unload that. We're gonna make this the same size. It's gonna to snap to the other window because that's my primary monitor. <sighs> that's fine. Okay, cool, let's compare that. We can see uh, the scaling happened, right? It, it took a look at the change in resolution when the plugin loaded and made the icon proportionally smaller. So it took up the same proportional width of the window and all the heights based on that proportionality. And so what we'd like to do is, can we do that um, when uh, live, when the resolution changes? Excellent question, let's find out. I don't think we need that little snip anymore. Uh, let's come back in and actually let's come to the documentation because this is a place where I'm not 100% sure where the screen has changed size is, but it's probably the same place as what is the current size of the screen. So we have turbine.ui.display, and in here we have some methods. Yeah, I was really hoping for a callback function, whoops. Let's double check the slightly more extensive, but the UI the, the, is just not to my taste. Um, over here on Lotro interface and come into display here. Okay, 
I don't see the callback here. I would really like to know when the screen size changes. Hmm. Let's see. I was just uh, clicking on engine earlier and I couldn't remember if that had that. Okay, so what do we do? Sometimes we just search Lotro plugin uh, sc screen no, resolution changes. Hmm. Well, that's not going to give me my answer, is it? Okay, where have I seen this happen? Well, someone was mentioning it before. What do we have? Yes, yes, but did I write down what it was? I did not. You know, some of the other uh, stuff that I've done, like the deed tracker, does care about such things. So, Let's see, size changed. Let's do a quick search and see if we can find that in the D tracker. Neat. Oh, that's exciting. Okay. So it looks like we checked to see if size changed is null. And if it's not, we set it to be a table and then we can add our own callback function. Fun. I wonder if that's all really necessary. If you're not working within an apartment, do you need to worry about that? Can you, does it have to be a table or could it just be a callback function? I think we should find out. Okay, so neat. We'll just pull that aside. Oops. Okay, so where are we going to care about that? Oh, thanks, uh, Mubot and Little Redhead. Yes, yeah, Skundabot is important. I hear. The dwarves are very big on it. Okay, we have a redraw function. The function is going to take into account the display get size. And then it relays out the controls based on that change in width and height. Neat, okay. So uh, in the constructor for the window is a place where we could go ahead and say, here's what we wanna do. Um, now, I don't know for sure what's gonna happen if I don't copy this directly. So it may work, it may not. So we can say turbine.ui.display.sizeChanged equals um, anonymous function, let's see. And in that function, we wanna call self redraw. Oh, right, let's see what happens. In fact, let's go ahead and spit out a turbine.shell.writeline. Resized, just to know that we're in the right place. Okay. So I'm going to drag the right window a little bit. Well, I got to say, I did not see an output. So that suggests that this was not the correct way to do it. Yeah. All right, we'll do the full blown making a table thing. All right, so I just lifted that code that works in the other plugin. Uh, yeah, still not doing it though. Whoops, stop going over to the other screen. Tell you what though, 
let's pull out our decoy. Okay, and we can see that it is not redrawing itself in size. So obviously that is not the correct way to determine if the screen is resizing. Ah, Rocky says, can you tell me what self and nil do? Yeah, sure thing. Let me go ahead and ignore that. Okay, so in a lot of languages, you have a concept of undefined. There's no value here. So if I were to say a local test value equals nil, I am saying this thing has no value, um, which is not the same as zero, which is having the value of zero or false, having the, the value of being um, treated as not true, right, or, or true. Uh, so saying nil is saying um, it's not there at all. There, there's been nothing to find. Uh, there's nothing here. And so when we're doing this, what we're really saying is, is the property size changed? And it's a funny way of doing it. Why are we? You could, all, you could also write it like this, which is, I think, which is what I'm more familiar with. Um, and so what we're really saying is, is the size change there at all? And if it's not, we want it to be a table. And once it is a table, we can call the table insert function to add ours into the list of functions that gets called when the display is changed. That's what's going on. Self is a way of dealing with um, the kind of object-oriented programming that is allowed through um, Lua in Lotro. So uh, Turbine originally put out some uh, helper files uh, that are still available that uh, make the class keyword do uh, some stuff under the covers. And so when we say that hunter deadly decoy window is uh, of type window, we are kind of declaring a subclass. And when we declare functions with the name of the class colon name of the function, then we can access the self variable, which if you're familiar with object-oriented programming is kind of a the thing that is currently being acted upon. So in the redraw function, redraw function is going to be called on a hunter deadly decoy window, and that window has um, the function set width. Then it says, I am way better at Lotro than Destiny 2, apparently. Are you are you out already? <laughs> well, either you need more practice there or less practice here. <laughs> okay, so I have underestimated the ease of which it is to uh, to hook into the size changed function of turbine.ui.display. I really thought that just lifting this from the other would work. It's entirely possible the other doesn't work. I may have lifted it from somewhere else. Oh, Rocky says, thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm gonna just pop into the one bag. No, nope, that's not it. Hmm. There we go. Sequence bars. Show me your secrets. Really. Oh, okay, add call. Oh, they're using the add callback. Yeah. Um, but they're still doing it. Add callback, you display, size changed, function, do stuff. Okay, I feel like uh, this should be doing that. Uh, I just haven't called, uh, uh, included in the, the helper libraries that have add callback as a, as a, as a thing. Hmm. Well, that just makes me very sad. Maybe it needs to be done at a higher level. Maybe it needs to be done in the main function instead. And if that's the case, that's easy enough to do. Uh, we'll just sneak into the main function here. We'll go ahead and use the same code as before. And 
we're going to use the hunter deadly decoy window variable and tell it to redraw. All right, that's, uh, that's an easy enough test. If that doesn't work, we'll just move on to something else. All right, well, it doesn't work. So uh, I will have to revisit that. I wonder if part of the problem is I'm in windowed mode. And so the size, if you come into graphics, um, the full screen resolution has not changed, although the, the width and the, the height have absolutely changed. Uh, so maybe that's causing a problem. Maybe I just have fundamentally misunderstood how I'm supposed to do this. That can happen too. Hey, Thorlor. Thorlor. So I am uh, trying to hook into the size changed uh, function of the display and it is just not working for me. Uh, and so this is the sort of this, um, if you did not have, have the add callback um, uh, library function, this was meant to, to uh, do what that was doing. And yet it is not working for me, which makes me sad. Or at least, uh, yeah, it doesn't seem to be working. Rocky says, question, do you like to test plugins from the community here? I don't know about testing plugins, but we've definitely have done some tweaking of existing plugins to uh, patch up. Um, Thurler says, using the code sent by Sensi, where did you send it to me? <laughs> um, so uh, we, have, we have done some patching of existing plugins to uh, to tweak them or to fix bugs. And so for instance, uh, we were looking at the Hunter Focus plugin uh, a month or two ago, and it was not working in a couple of ways and we were able to just tweak it, issue a patch, and now uh, it does work. <laughs> oh, you did send that to me, didn't you? All right, we're gonna see how, how much it lags out my computer to open up Discord. I have it closed because I don't need anyone messaging me normally. Neat. Dun, dun, dun. Ah. If you want to automatically respond to screen size changes, here is some code that adds a size change event to the Turbine UI display object. It exploits the fact, bug, that all stretch modes. In fact, I'm gonna copy this so it's not just me reading it. All right, so responding to screen resizes. Cool. Thank you for reminding me that you sent that to me. That was very handy. Okay. So what he has sent, what Thurlor has sent, I should say, um, is uh, exploits the fact or bug that all stretched windows get unstretched and generate a size change event when the display size changes. Excellent, so we get a window and we're gonna set the stretch mode, set the size to just to be a one by one. Uh, set once update, set stretch mode to one. Really? You have to set once updates multiple times? That's exciting. Uh, we have an update function in here. We're gonna go ahead and set the size, ignore size change events, uh, turn off once updates. Awesome. And then our new update function and do a callback size changed. Neat. Oh, okay. That, that was not necessary. Okay. And then in the size changed, if that's ignore, then that set. That is delightfully convoluted. Okay, so it sounds like this is, whoops, where did I go? It sounds like this is one half of it of saying this is the callback I want to be called. 
but that um, th in order to generate that, you need this helper object to actually um, do the turbine UI display size change callback. Do I have that right? Where turbine, like this is a, a thing that we have created, not that it is in general um, available to us. If that's the case, then while this is a more generic solution, in here we could just do the thing that we want to do. Okay. It needs to wait until the next frame update to generate the event. Fascinating. All right. Well, tell you what, let's go ahead and try this out. Worst case, it doesn't work. But then again, my current code wasn't working either. So, all right, create um, display size changed nonsense. Cool. And then we're going to go ahead and just do that right here so we can see it. And then we're going to go ahead and pull this in. Oh, tab it out correctly, please. Thank you. Okay, so we have that. We're going to add some vertical white space here. Excellent. So we are setting a global variable called display size listener. And this seems pretty uh, uh, drop in ready. So let's just see. First of all, does it parse? It does parse. Well, that's delightful. All right. Now we can see something tried to happen. Uh, attempt to call a global. Of course, that's my mistake. I don't have uh, any of uh, any of the functions here that would be uh, useful. Um, You know what? We're we're just going to be lazy, and instead of doing it the right way, we'll just go ahead and call the stuff I want to call. Let's see. And we don't even worry about that right now. Okay, so we do have that. Oh, that's pretty. You can, we can see that the size of the window is shrinking. Uh, live in response to the change of the uh, window. Now, real question, does that do it when the window is in unlock mode? It does! Oh my goodness, that's very exciting. Okay, so we can see uh, as the screen is maybe about half the original size, the uh, the size here also. Now what we haven't done is do any updating of the value here in the scroll bar. So if we, we can see that this needs some updating as well, otherwise it's gonna get out of sync. All right, well that is progress right there. All right. You now I keep meaning to do this. Let's see, who else's name do I already have in this file? All right, if I've missed you, uh, that is a mistake and we'll add it in as we go. This, this is a living document. Uh, okay, cool. So we have the ability to detect resizing. What we're not doing is updating this to match. So for instance, if we come in here and make the window way bigger, this should have gone up to something about eight, right? About that. So we just need to do the, the calculation again. Okay, so let's take a look in, where is that? Well, in the main is where we create the options control. And so the scaling scroll bar, currently we don't have a way to update that because we don't have that saved off anywhere. 
Um, and the same thing with the label. So we would need to save that off somewhere. And that can be as simple as saving it as a global variable instead of a function local variable. Um, and then once we have that, we could have a function to update it. Okay. Well, the scroll bar, uh, when we set that initial value, we are setting it based off of this formula. So maybe we want to pull that out somewhere. Function set scroll um, uh, scale values from no update scale. Ah oh man, naming these is hard. Update scale label and bar from uh, screen size. You can make your function names as long as you want. The important thing is that you know what it's trying to do. Okay, so we know that the scaling scroll bar value is based off of the requested width and the actual window. So we can do that here where we say, okay, the scroll bar value uh, is the width uh, which is a proportional value that the user has saved times the current width of the screen. And fully, foolish me, I didn't actually, um, I didn't actually write down why I'm multiplying by 10 dividing by 32, but I'm sure it's important. <laughs> and we want to go ahead and remember to make these globals and get that set, set text function call and the set value function call. Neat. Well, we could give that a try actually. <laughs> Exo says, I did the dumb thing and produced a custom numerical font. I just forgot one thing, kerning. The misalignment, it's murder. Yeah, it reminds me of, uh, as many things do, of an XKCD comic, if, uh, um, if you are not familiar. Let's see, there we go. There you go. Bravo says, should have used a fix with font. There are some nice ones. For instance, in the Lucida console. Well, yeah, I like Lucida. Anyway, yeah. Um, properly aligning fonts is hard. That, that's why I try to stay away from any sort of custom fonting and just let, let the literal UI deal with it. Uh, it's not optimal, but it saves my brain for other things. Okay. <laughs> you were the one who was talking about curtaining. <laughs> Excellent. We do want to go ahead and make sure remember to call this function. Otherwise, we'll be very confused about why it's not happening. So again, uh, this is not a good way. What we should have is just a generic, this thing generates events, and then we respond to the event. But we're doing the quick and easy way of just throwing this in here. Um, so. When in doubt, yeah, do the right way, um, extract out a little bit so this can be its own standalone thing. In fact, this should probably be in its own file uh, and not know anything about what we're doing right here. We'll, we'll see if we can circle back around on that by making a note. Uh, move, where did I, what did I pop, call it? There we go. Move that into own file put call back back in so it doesn't know about the specifics. That'll be nicer for later. Oh, hey. Hi, Evola. Um, looks like the Prowler trailer just went up on YouTube. Nice. Thriller says, I put it in utils.lua along with all the other things that I think should exist in the API, but don't exactly. Anything we find helpful. Um, cool. So right now though, I just want to see it work. So, uh, let's come on in and load this up. 
And let's go ahead and resize the window here. Awesome, lovely. We can see that the scaling was eight when, when that took up the entire width of the window, or I should say my monitor. Now, if it only takes up half, we're down to about half. That is so beautiful. Okay, so the plugin itself is scaling and uh, the value in the options is scaling. Ah, oh, so good. That's, that's very pleasing to me. And if I make my window the size of the screen, it pops over onto the other desktop. Whoops. <laughs> Unless links back into the background to beta brawler wiki stuff. Well, thank you very much for all the work you do on the wiki. <laughs> Thorlo says, now try having the scroll bar at the extremes and resizing. No, I haven't actually um, uh, capped the values to be sane. So I think instead what I should do is take a little snapshot of the code. I think it's in a better place than it was. Uh, so we're going to come on in here and we're going to go ahead and let's see, in the readme, we're going to say plugin responds to, to um, client resolution changes. Sure. And then we can go ahead and make a little snapshot. Now in our main, we have that show debug options equals true. I don't want that, but I do want everything else. That all looks great. So I'm gonna say yes to that and then come back in and say not to that. And then we can commit everything but that as a snapshot. Cool. It responds to resolution changes, awesome. All right, Little Redhead says, very dramatic music in that 30 second preview. Awesome, who doesn't love a little drama with their brawlers? I mean, hobbits, hobbits are very dramatic. Okay, so Thorlore said, what happens if you test at the extremes? I don't know, let's find out. So we have a 0 0.5, <laughs> which is already ridiculously small. If I shrink it down, um, well, you know, it got smaller. So the plugin itself is getting smaller, but of course the scroll bar is not. Um, so is that a problem? Yeah, we should probably not let us get below 0 0.5. And we noticed that once we came back up, uh, yeah. So let's go ahead and make sure we can't go below uh, a certain scaling amount. Uh, so where will we do that? In main, we have, all right, create display size change nonsense, excellent. Um, in the updates, we have the redraw. So that's a great place. Uh, redraw is where we are dealing with all of these calculations. So image scaling, we have that idea of the final image width divided by the, the image width. And that's the scaling also that we're showing over here. So if we're showing a 32 uh, pixel wide, then that's one times, because that's what the original is. If we're showing 64, that's two times. Hopefully I'm not misremembering the details here. Uh, but if that's the case, then if image scaling oops, is less than 0 0.5, then image scaling equals 0 0.5. And if image scaling is greater than 10, then image scaling equals 10. End. Okay, so if we use that, we can uh, cap the minimum and maximum values of that scaling. Now let's see if that seems like a good idea. Okay, so we have, my radar is in the wrong place. All right, so we do have a ridiculously small scale thing there. We're gonna bring it back up. Yeah, excellent. So if we have a smaller window and we bring the scaling up, then what we wanna see, yeah, what we wanna see is that as we get bigger, it doesn't get any bigger. This is an absolute maximum. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Uh, this is 320 pixels wide, no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, excellent. 
Same thing, if we get down to here, we're at 16 pixels wide, we don't ever want to get fewer than 16 pixels. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Awesome. Now, what happens if we come down here and then we start getting bigger? It's, it's going to behave a little weirdly, right? Like we started at 1x, or sorry, 0.5x, now we're back up to 0.9x. I think that's an acceptable thing. I don't really care about remembering what the, the authorial intent here was, or the, the user intent, because this is just, uh, these are uh, edge cases of edge cases. I feel like a lot of players just, they run Lotro and it's whatever resolution and that's great. And so uh, this is doing something sensible-ish <laughs> if you're changing your resolution a lot, except look at that scaling factor. That is just a lot of extra digits of precision right there. So let's come back in here and uh, image scaling factor can't get too big or too small on resolution change. Awesome. Now, actually I say that, but you know what I haven't tried is unloading the plugin and then reloading the plugin. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and make the window smaller. Um, and let's go ahead and scale it up to 10. Unload that. Oops, unload that. So it saves it out to file, change the window size, and then load it again. All right, so obviously we have missed a step. Or have we? Because, oh, yep, we definitely have. That is an impressive 21 times bigger than, uh, that's delightful. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the code where we're loading it in has the same issue. All right, well, let's take a look at that. If we go to our main function, we see a load settings function that seems like a dandy place to go look for our settings. Uh, the settings themselves are in globals. That's where we're loading and saving the settings from. So we have width and what are we doing with that width? How interesting. Hmm. Yeah, so if we saved that it was 25% you know, of the screen width that was you know, 600, and now it's much bigger, uh, let's go ahead and figure out where we're using this. And that might be an easier place, is just uh, where are we using it? Now, if you are using a text editor that can do recursive searching or searching multiple files at once, uh, then this is exactly where that shines. We're gonna come in for Hunter Deadly Decoy, search for settings window width, and find all the places it's being used. Sweet. All right, so globals, yep. Um, okay. I'm kind of glancing here at the places it's being used. Let me draw. But the reality is, we could constrain its value when it comes in. And that might actually be the right place. So we could say if um, settings.window.width times this is greater than 320 or you know 10x in pixels, this is a hard-coded number and I wouldn't recommend it, but then we can go ahead and say Settings with that with equals 320 divided by, does that make sense? Yeah. And in fact, we could save off that width here. We don't need to call it multiple times. Uh, screen width equals that. Ah, display, all right. Display width equals that. So we could do something like this. Same thing if the uh, settings.windows.width value, if it's too small, we could go ahead and constrain it right here. So if that times display width is less than 16, and again, these magic numbers, we really need to extract those out somewhere. <laughs> Third lore says, just make a wrapper for scroll bar set value that enforces limits. Yeah, that's, that's entirely possible. Um, I'm doing it here because I'm lazy and I don't wanna find all the places where this could be impacting things because the size of the image, it doesn't actually look at the scroll bar, it looks at this value, right? 
Uh, and so, yes, I do want the visual of this image to be capped, but I also don't want uh, the window uh, to be capable of doing this. Uh, and so my theory is that if I cap it here, it just uh, won't, we won't be able to get into that situation. Let's find out. Uh, and then settings width equals um, 16 times, oops, sorry, display width. So we're scaling up the minimum and maximum to be a percentage of the width. Awesome. So we'll do something about these magic numbers in a bit, but first let's take a look. Neat. Okay. So we can see we loaded that in, but let's go ahead and reproduce what happened before. So we went ahead and made something that was 10 times. We unloaded it. We made the window much bigger. That's why it was, that's why it was going to be 20 times. But let's go ahead and load that in and take a look. Awesome. So we've constrained that at the point that we loaded the setting in from the file and we said, are you just impossible with the configuration as it is right now? Now, the one thing that we don't have is a good um, handling of this number right here. I would very much like that to uh, look better. When we come in to the draw options control, we can take a look at the label here uh, and we can see that the text is just using divide the value by 10 uh, we're not doing any sort of actual formatting, and we should be doing formatting. Um, now, if we forget how to do that, we can come into string.format, the call that we're calling inside the update function, because this update function is um, doing decimal values. And we can see, okay, string.format percent dot number. Neat. Okay, we can just go ahead and lift that right into our function here. Okay, so um, where are we? We're right here. So this is, okay, scaling scroll bar text equals string dot format. We're doing a precision of one. And we're passing in that value. And that's going to give us a string with a single decimal precision. Well, can't do it in there. Uh, instead of just getting a number divided by 10 and getting arbitrary amounts of precision, that just is not going to look very nice. Okay. So did it work? No, look at that. I still need to divide that value by 10. Excellent. Okay, there we go. We have 7.1. If we come in here, 6.9, unload, reload, I'm sorry, 5.9, and it's still 5.9. So we can come in, we can resize, we can unload, we can reload, 4.8, awesome. Under the covers, it's probably slightly bigger or smaller, and that's okay. This is not a super precise system. If you need your plugin to be exactly 422 pixels wide, this is just not going to do that, and that's okay. All right, let's take a look. What changes did we actually make there? Well, we did a hard cap at the point of loading in the setting to make sure it was never less than or greater than what we wanted it to be. But I really don't like those magic numbers in there. So before we commit stuff, oh, but we can, we can commit this because this was just a precision display fix. So fixed scroll, uh, scroll. Yeah, bar label to not uh, show too many digits of precision. Great, nice little bug fix there. So what's going on with these numbers and where can I put them that is better? Well, uh, we should have somewhere the size of things. And if we don't, we really need it. So let's see, where does the number 32 exist? Um, well, it exists in the redraw function, 
That's a very specific place. Anywhere else? Oh, I still don't know what that 10 and 32 is. We'll get back to that. Okay, yeah, yeah, the scaling factor, yeah. Um, 32 times scale value, oh my goodness. I need, I need to stop writing magic numbers. That's what I need. But for now, let's take, uh, and when I say magic numbers, those are just numbers that you find in the code like this, um, but without a name attached to them. Here we can see it's meant to be the width of the image. Lovely. Let's go ahead and hoist those out into our globals file. And we're gonna go ahead and put them somewhere. Let's, let's put them here. And we need to get rid of the local because local variables to a file do not behave nicely anymore. Uh, and so we, it's named the same thing, so that shouldn't break anything. Uh, but we can say uh, minimum image width equals 16 and maximum image width equals, but we don't even have to do that. We could say 32 divided by two and 32 times 10, just to give us that connection between the starting number and how we're um, uh, treating that with the scaling factor. So we can even say min, um, what did I call it? My goodness. Scaling, my goodness. Min scaling equals 0 0.5, max scaling equals 10. Um, using consistent terms throughout the code will be helpful. Oh, yes, excellent, thank you. A further points out, one more place where we can get rid of that 32. Now, we could even pull out this somehow uh, to a separate a variable, but I think uh, that's sort of obvious enough what's going on. Um, so if we really needed to, we could pull these out into their own separate variables. Uh, we'll leave it there for right now. Neat, okay. So here, <laughs> we can go ahead and make use of these in here. Uh, so we have minimum image width, awesome, no more 16 there. Um, and then maximum image width. And I don't need to do this, but it makes me a lot more comfortable to extra parenthesize things because it is, it is not the case in Lua, but it is technically possible in some languages for it to parse like this, where it says, first of all, is display with less than minimum image width, true or false, and then we multiply either zero or one by the width. Uh, and it just eliminates the possibility if we go ahead and explicitly parenthesize that. Okay, uh, Little Redhead says, question for the expert. Someone in World on Treebeard is having trouble loading Songbook. Is getting a Songbook Lua, attempt to index tracks, a number value is the error. Well, that's an excellent question. Tell them to tune in to plug in along. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and add a songbook. Now, one of the really neat things about Lotro plugins is that all of the source is right there on your computer and you can look at it. So we can come in, songbook is by Chiron. Thank you very much for an excellent plugin. And we can come in and let's see, that was songbook window. So come on in here, songbook window. And let's take a look at line one, five, five, zero. My goodness, that's a lot. Okay, so songs database dot, songs dot tracks. Okay, what I would recommend is if they have not used the, um, the hypertext application recently, they should probably just regenerate that. Um, so what that means is in Chiron, and this is good advice in general for Songbook, Songbook uses an external application, a hypertext application, and it looks in your Lord of the Rings online music folder, which plugins don't normally have access to, and it uh, takes all of this information in here and puts it together into a plugin data file, which your plugin does have access to. Now, be forewarned, hypertext applications uh, can do whatever, pretty much whatever you can do on your computer. So you do want to be careful um, running them. Uh, I should say hypertext applications may be constrained in a sandbox. I would have to look into that. But the JavaScript, um, 
the JavaScript that runs in there does have a lot of uh, capabilities to look at files on your system, read, read them, write new files, and so forth. Thorlore points out, if they regenerate the song list by doing this process and still get the error, uh, Thorlore would say, that probably means you have an invalid ABC file. That's a really interesting idea. Uh, let's take a look, another look here. So we have songs.tracks. Now, it would take more time than we have right now to dig into how this is being populated, but absolutely, uh, it's always worth, uh, when in doubt, go into your music folder and remove everything but one song you know works and then regenerate and make sure Songbook can load that. If that's the case, then it's not a Songbook problem, it's an ABC file problem. So whoever you are, if you're out there, if you see this uh, uh, now or later, do give that a shot. Do try regenerating. If it's still an error, try regenerating against a smaller number of ABC files. If you added ABC files recently, uh, maybe one of them is, to, is the culprit. So when in doubt, uh, sort by your modified to find uh, the most recent files and just start maybe picking away at those and saying, nope, 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 until uh, it generates correctly. Now, it might not be an ABC file issue, but those are the first two places I would check is have you regenerated um, using the hypertext application? Uh, and do you have any new ABC files that might be causing problems? Um, I'm hearing that I was talking fast. Oh, hey. Okay. Uh, oh, that's the wrong window. Let's see. Apparently, someone in world uh, on this server. Let's see. Okay. Uh, well, you, you've got the text uh, that, I, that I said more or less. I am noticing that these windows got moved around when I was squishing the screen. Okay. Okay, uh, so, whoops, where went? Uh, where were we? <laughs> Excellent question. We were just fixing some of those magic numbers. So now we've pulled out image width and image height, minimum image width, minimum uh, image height, uh, and we added some extra parentheses to the check here because I'm being a little uh, paranoid. Neat. And then we moved these out of there. Also neat. What we didn't do was actually test to make sure we didn't break anything. Let's go ahead and do that now. Lovely. It's there. Uh, and if we go ahead and shrink this down, we can see it shrinking also. Let's go ahead and see everything all together. Great. Okay. Everything seems to be working like we're expecting. So we can go ahead and commit that. Fixed magic number issue. Okay, so I think we are have made really good progress, but we are kind of running out of time here. So let's skip down to the localization. All right, I didn't add it to the to-do file. So localize. We want to go through and make sure all of the text is uh, localized so that it can be translated to French, German, Russian, whatever, should someone want to do that. No one's reached out to me so far, but uh, give it time. Uh, so what we want to do is come in and basically find any use of quotes and check them out. Okay. Time left. That's just numbers. We're okay with that. Okay. Nothing in the head uh, hunter double decoder. But we can be a little bit more vigorous and say, okay, let's see. Cool, cool, cool. I know where I thought there was something. Oh, well, all that target changed stuff, but that doesn't really count. Let's make that a little bit bigger. Oh, the scaling itself, right? That was one of them. Okay. So how do we localize? Well, there is a table that we can use in what I call the strings file. And if we put a string in here with any possible translations that we have, then this is a centralized place that someone can come in and uh, translate. All right, so we have options. We already have the lock window. So let's go ahead and add scaling. 
So we already know what the English translation is. Uh, so we're going to hoist that on out. Hmm. Okay, so um, we want to go ahead and... Oh, I believe I have done this in multiple places. Just double checking thing here. Okay, so um, the change that I made earlier to fix the decimal point thing is actually, uh, we wanna go ahead and combine that with the localization. <laughs> Thorlor has volunteered some uh, preliminary translations. Sure. Um, Portuguese, really? Is there a fan Portuguese? Sure. Just double checking something. Okay, so, um, well, it won't be quite in there yet, but we can go ahead and start with that. Ah, Sequence Bars has a Portuguese translation. That's fascinating. I heard there was an unofficial Russian translation, which is just um, really cool. Uh, oops. Uh, and it makes me wonder um, how that works. So what we want is to combine the string formatting with the text. And we can do that, uh, let's see, do we have any examples here? Neat, we do. Uh, we're at string.format of stuff. So let's bring that on down so we can take a look at that uh, in situ here. So string.format, uh, and we know the text, uh, we know we want it to be something like this. But we want to take advantage of the format right here. So we have string.format scaling. Oh, too many quotes right there. And we pass parameters in uh, after the string itself. So scaling that, let's see. I wonder if we could put the X right here. Is that gonna confuse it? Let's find out. Okay, actually I'm gonna comment out those lines because the whole text in itself, I'm not ready to have that. Oh, Thorlor says the client was translated into Russian by reverse engineering the client. Fantastic. Um, that seems like a lot of text in the game to translate, so. Hmm. Okay, so does this work? Let's find out. So how do we use it? Well, we've already seen it in some other places. So what we want us to do is uh, lang.options. Uh, what do we call it? Scaling, scaling. Uh, oh, but uh, the problem is we're not actually ready to use this right here. So what we actually want to do is use it the other way. Where we use this in a call to string dot format. And then this parameter will get passed in to here. So no string.format here. We're not ready to do the formatting. Okay, let's take a look. 
Any chance that works? No! Bad argument number one, two, format. Let's do it. 134. Um, let's see. String expected got table. Well, that's delightful. Uh, let's try instead the number value that is unformatted. Really? String dot format. Oh, of course. I didn't actually do a get string. I left it out in my excitement. Okay, so we can come back in, we can see scaling. We didn't actually divide this thing by 10 the way we were doing before. Okay, so we have a scaling 5.5. Dan says, good night, have a great rest of the stream. Well, good night to you. I feel like we're getting close to the end here, but I know uh, some, sometimes we have a hard stop. Oh, speaking of which, next week I would like to shift forward in time to start an hour earlier uh, because we'll be starting some classes uh, that happen in the morning and we'll want to be able to get some sleep before then. So hopefully that doesn't inconvenience too many people, but next week I expect to start at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So do hope to see you there. Okay, so we've seen this working. Now we just need to make sure we do it here as well. Now, Ideally, we'd have this only in one place, but um, we'll, we'll go ahead and deal with that as a future problem. Lang.options.scaling, and then we're gonna go ahead and pass in that divided by 10. And let's take a look at that with perhaps the right number of close parentheses. Lovely. So if we come in here and change that, we can see scaling 5.2. If we manually change it, Come back up. Awesome. Everything is being adjusted as we want. Now, it turns out this is completely redundant. Neat. I love it when we can just delete code. We should actually like rerun to make sure. Excellent. Uh, so we're doing the formatting of the text and the translating of the text in one go. That's lovely. Now I'm gonna go ahead and pull out the German and French right now because I'd feel much better if a German or, or French speaker uh, did the whole thing and not just the word. Then again, I suppose there's not much harm in pulling this in and if one of them does not like the X at the end, they can contact me with a translation. Awesome. Now, there's like one thing in the UI that's actually look, uh, translated. Excellent. Cool. Uh, well, did we find anything else that needed to be done? Let's scroll back through here. Uh, we were around here. Um, hmm. Same thing here. So we want to go ahead and update that with scaled value. Neat. Uh, anything else? Uh, deploy dec uh, dummy decoy. Oh, that's all. That's all um, debug stuff. We don't need to worry about that. And resize. Oh, we definitely want to stop uh, with that. Are we even still doing that? Yes, we are. Okay, so that was a good catch. We did not mean to commit that. All right. Lovely, and then here's all the Lang stuff. And here's some other stuff we don't need to worry about. Cool, okay. Well then, that was the last thing I wanted to do before we ship this out. Just in case someone wanted to come in and make a French or German version of those strings, uh, we're ready to go for all of them. Neat. So, um, let's see. I don't really feel like uh, it makes sense to include <laughs> um, uh, localization notes in version notes. It just, you know, it's one of those things where, where it should be one of the, uh, just always there, right? Like it should be assumed that it could be translated. Um, but I, I mean, we could add a note like localization is still supported, but I'm not even gonna bother to put it in there. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and add those strings. 
and use it here, and use it here, and use it here, and we'll come back to that debug. All right, localized missing strings. Now, because we did the, the correct thing, it actually ended up simplifying the code where we didn't have that one specialized uh, place where we were formatting things, uh, and that, that is nice to see. All right, removed debug output. Fun. Okay, well, first I'm gonna push this out and then we're gonna release this real fast before I go and fall asleep. Exo says the kerneling war has been won. Excellent, excellent. So we're, are you generating images from a font and then you know some of, the, some of them were just slightly offset pixel-wise from the edge or uh, was it something more complicated than that? You need to make a table of offsets. Oh, okay. Well, it's cool that you uh, were able to do that in the course of one plugging along episode. All right, um, so this is the text that's gonna go on Lutra interface when we release. Not much is changing here. Um, I'm still gonna say that there aren't any known issues. Well, I will say um, window locking and unlocking, what is that? Unlocking window does not mix well with using a decoy. Lock the window to make things work. Cool, and then we can go ahead and add a little note to our version release here. So we're gonna call this 10-05 version 1.0.1. And what on earth did we do? Uh, now, we have that readme file, and that's why I'm doing it uh, constantly as I go along, because this is just automatic, right? This is what happened. But if I was um, wanted to have all of this, I would probably put it on a post on the Lotro forum and not necessarily right here in the description, but I'll do some highlights right here. So that, let's see, shows number of seconds remaining. Uh, as text and added um, scaling option. Neat. The rest of this, um, dun, dun, dun. yeah. Uh, so what I've been in the past, uh, and what we might do here is to say, let's see, where, where did I do this? I took inspiration from Thurlore on the deed tracker. So when we come into the deed tracker, we can see revision history um, with a quick little summary and then the release notes are here with a link over to the uh, Lotro forums for that kind of thing. So uh, I would do that. I might come back and do that later. Uh, we don't need a full release. People can always look at the readme file when they download it. So uh, that's good. And then we probably need an updated uh, image to show. So let's put the scaling to something reasonable um, all right, I didn't lock the window first. Uh, and I'm just setting up the snipping tool over here. All right, Exo says, might need a bit of fine tuning, but it's not egregious anymore. Excellent, Thorlor says, what font are you using? Exo says, Gotham Ultra Bold. You know, I'm not sure if I know what that one is. Oh, um. We're gonna go ahead and do this and do a new little snip here. Save that off to MS Paint and then come back in and do a new snip here. Lovely. So we have kind of a starting and a uh, later on. And we can save these. Uh, da -da -da. 
in Documents. This is Lord of the Rings Online, of course, Plugins, Cube Plugins, it's me, Hunter Dilly Decoy, and I just call it website, it, I need something, right? Uh, so this is a version 101, and I do like saving historical versions because if you get five or 10 versions down the way, it can be really insightful, eye-opening, traumatizing to go look back at your early versions and be like, oh, we've come a long way. Uh, uh, why aren't you saving my uh, location? All right. So coming in, so we do a different program, that's why. And we're going to go ahead and save uh, this one. Excellent. Exo says, the questions remain. Am I willing to take the extra step towards making this a fully scalable numerical font? And Thurlor says, this may have some useful ideas to it and links to a virtual interface font metrics. All right. Let's take a look. Calculate the width and pixels of given string for a given font. Oh. Does it uh, use the scroll bar trick? Neat, okay. Um, that is not a right now thing, but thank you for sharing that thriller. Okay, um, neat, okay, where are we? Uh, we have a couple of updated screenshots and all we need now is a release. This is a database of character widths. Oh, nice. Okay, did, did someone go through and manually measure pixels for each of the, the supported characters? That is dedication if they did. Okay, we have plug and long releases. You know what, we should probably have the source folder. So, Lord of the Rings, plugins, cube plugins, it's me. Uh, and here we go. So, we had a Hunter Deadly Decoy version one we're gonna go ahead and start with that as a base release folder. And this is just a little bit extra checking that I do. You don't have to do it this way. And in fact, if you're using the, the SVN um, source control on Lotro interface, I hear there's an automatic release function. But, oh goodness, I did that wrong. Okay, but um, th this is just a process that works for my head. So re really the important thing is, uh, can you ship it? And if you can, great. All right, let's come on in. We can see that we fixed the path of the image and we updated the version. Sweet, that is good. And in 100 Deadly Decoy, we can see, I don't want to ship the to-do file or the decoy a health by levels spreadsheet. Uh, it does not belong there. But the rest of this, that seems great. We have lots of cool stuff. We did that today. Hunter to the decoy window. Oh my goodness, so much stuff. Uh, the main file, we can see some of the things we did today. The one thing we don't want is that show debug options. That's just inconvenient, especially because we didn't fix that chat spam from the target switching. All right, but the rest of this is good. We're gonna copy that over and we're going to save. And we can see the only difference is that show debug options. If we wanted to be really nice to ourselves, we could come in and we could go ahead and um, stash one file and we'll just call that a hunter debug. Awesome. And now it doesn't even show up as one of the differences. Oh, that's fun. That's probably actually better. Okay. Leaving it in is, is better. All right, we'll undo that stash. I was trying to be fancy. Cool, so globals uh, and the window, we're good to go. The readme and the strings, we're good to go there. All right, stop showing me the stuff that's this good. Okay, and the only difference in main is that. So we're good to go. We can sh uh, ship that on out. Now, Remember your zip file structure needs to be uh, matching your previous one. And so when I make a 100 Deadly Decoy zip file, I wanna make sure that what goes into it isn't this outer one, it's this cube plugins directly. 
and we can tell we've done it correctly. We come in here, cube plugins, it's gonna have the hunter deadly decoy right there. Now, can I? Nope, I can't, it doesn't like that. But I might be able to double click it. Yeah, okay. We can come in here, version 101, we're good. Okay, we have a zip. So coming into Lotro interface, we can go ahead and upload an update. Now you do need to be logged in for this, but if you're doing an updating, it's going to have a list of things that you've done. In this case, we're gonna go for the Hunter Deadly Decoy. Go! And we're gonna go ahead and modify it. Now, when in doubt, you can also do this from the interface itself. So if I were to come into Hunter Deadly Decoy, excellent. Uh, at the bottom, if you're logged in and it's yours, you'll see an edit button. And you can see that the uh, resulting screen you get to is the same. It's editfile.php with the ID of your plugin. So these are identical ways to get there. Okay, so we have an updated version. We're gonna replace with, well, let's go ahead and Grab that path, Oop, one up. We've got the Hunter Deadly Decoy at version 101. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and update the text here. Whoops. Uh, we've already updated it here in uh, our saved version. And we can just paste it in here. We do wanna update the images, which are down below, excellent. Uh, so we can manage those images. Uh, and we're gonna change Uh, and for that one, we're going to be back in our plugins directory. So let's go cube plugins, it's me, Hunter and website. So we're at version 101. And we wanna go ahead and keep that caption. Decoy has just been summoned. And, oh, that's funny. Okay, let's remove that. And decoy is running, at, oh. I didn't actually do a health one. All right, let's come back in. So I wanna have my snipper ready. And we wanna go ahead and summon this out and do some pre preemptive damage here. And then we'll be ready to take that snip. Oh, that doesn't really tell the story I'm trying to tell though, does it? All right, 2,600. Uh, we'll just do almost all the damage right there. <laughs> That's too much damage, isn't it? I'm not convinced that looks good either. All right. Okay, that'll be a good amount. Making screenshots that convey what you're trying to convey is, it seems hard. Okay, very cool. Now, due to the way the snipper works, I don't think you actually get to see that happening, but that's okay. Okay, so we can come back in and we're, there we go, manage the images. Too many windows open. Uh, we can go ahead and copy that, but remove it. And then we'll go ahead and choose. We're gonna go ahead and pick that one and come back in, upload. Okay, so close the window. I like to come back in just to double check, lovely. Uh, and then do we allow updates? Of course. I love the community helping each other. Okay, let's go ahead and hit um, update. So we get redirected to the screen. It warns us that this could take a while. Often it goes fast, especially if you um, are in the system already. Let's go ahead and go on back to Hunter Deadly Decoy. And we can see there's an updated flag here. Uh, and so 
The file is currently waiting approval. If you hit, hit download, it's going to say, do you want a previous version of it? Excellent. And there's chat happening. Awesome. Taylor says my code usually uses the scroll bar trick with a binary search. Yeah, um, I've, I've done a little bit of that and I, I don't even do a binary search. It's just like make it bigger by 20 pixels until it's big enough kind of thing, but don't go too big. Um, it's just one of those, I can't be bothered uh, for the deed tracker. There's just so many elements on there and I just can't be bothered to do um, anything more complicated. Um, but maybe the binary search would be faster. It's just harder to convince myself it's right. Access says, I'm only using numbers. I can't use the default fonts at all. Borders aren't strong enough for the level of clarity that I want. That's fair. Uh, admittedly, I don't know what impact the extra 100 images used for numbers might be having on performance. <laughs> the other suggests do a stress test with the characters covering the screen. If the client doesn't crash and frame rate doesn't crash to zero, you're golden. <laughs> you should definitely cache the images with turbine.ui.graphic though. And then Exo asks if there's a forum post that talks about turbine.ui.graphic. Uh, Thurler says probably somewhere, but it's simple. Instead of set background file name, use local BG background equals turbine.ui.graphic file name and set background BG. Then you use that image many times without accessing the file. Nice, thanks for going through that thriller. Okay, uh, well, while I was reading that, has this updated? No, it's still awaiting approval. Once it's been approved, we will be able to download version 1.0.1. Uh, in the meantime, that was nifty. All right, I'm gonna close a few windows here. Um, neat. So, uh, what did we do? We just did a release and we added a couple things here, which means we should commit those as well. All right, so v1.0.1 artifacts. We're gonna commit those, push them on out. And then most source control supports tagging. This is an excellent time to, for us to go ahead and um, make a new tag for 1.0.1. So we can find that easily if we need to backtrack later. All right, Thurlor says, what are you going to do next time? That's a really excellent question, actually. We've had um, a grand old time making this Hunter plugin, but I feel like um, there's, there's kind of an endless well of little bits and pieces we could do, uh, but it's really serving its function, right? You can tell when the thing's going to explode and how much health it has left. And beyond that, I think it really needs to get some use by at least my, my hunter, my in-house hunter, if not other people in the community, and then get some feedback. Uh, Cause I can think of all sorts of cool things maybe, but I wanna see an actual hunter tell me what's good for them. Uh, so I think it's time to move on something else. And if nothing else, there's some outstanding Titan bar um, issues with currencies I was interested in going to. Oh, opacity slider, that's an interesting idea. So if we wanted to continue developing here, we could have an opacity slider. So this whole thing, like the opaque uh, quest tracker, um, we we could control, and in fact, we have a way to do that like this. Uh, so we could control if it's see-through or not. Uh, that's an interesting idea. I think I'll throw it onto the pile. Let's see, so to do. All right, later. Add an opacity slider. <laughs> Doom style health bar. Image of the dummy gets more beat up at lower health thresholds. Um, change the image to reflect health status. I like it. Um, we'll go ahead and give you credit in there. Uh, right, there's there's lots of things we could do here. Um, if we wanted to move on to other things, have a little a breather from uh, huntering things, uh, we're coming up on another festival and I have noticed there are a few currencies where Titan Bar has some issues and it might be nice to go through and uh, put out a patch for ones we know about and make sure that the, uh, the Harvest Math tokens I forget what they're called. Uh, make sure that they're working because I'm gonna want to be able to track those on the Titan bar as well coming up here. Um, and I hear that happens like in a couple weeks. It's pretty soon. Uh, there's like, uh, let's see. 
get a, no events. Yeah, let's take a look at that. All right, harvest math starts on the 13th. Okay, so the day after. So yes, I think taking a look and making sure, I'll, I'll check um, ahead of time and make sure harvest math uh, doesn't need anything more than just a tweak, if, if anything. Um, Titan bar probably has been updated since the last time I looked, so it may already have uh, those taken into account. Exo says brawler coming up around next week, perhaps something with that. I haven't looked at the brawler at all. Um, Maybe a plugin that just at the top says, you're a brawler, yarrr. But, oh, Third Lord says, is Bull Roar up now? You know, I don't know. Uh, if I try to launch it, it's probably gonna try to patch. Oh, Exo says yes, awesome. <laughs> oh, and uh, Taliran says it is as well. Hello, welcome to chat. You may have been lurking. Okay, um, neat. So. As a reminder, next week I'm going to start an hour earlier. I'm going to shift back, so I'll be starting 2 p.m. Eastern time. I hope that doesn't inconvenience too many of you, but we do want to be getting to bed before midnight uh, when classes start in a few weeks. Uh, let's see. Aura's plugin has brought our stuff. Totally check it out. Yeah, I may actually um, pull that up. Let me make a note to myself. Where did I put it? Aha. Next week. Check out Aura's plugin with brawlers. Look at Titan Bar currencies. Excellent. I'll have some notes for next time. Okay, Eldoleth has uh, useful information. Thank you for the link. Awesome. And thank you, Little Redhead, for getting Moobot to share information. Okay, um, well, I think we've just had a really good time here. We've gone ahead and made some good changes to the Hunter Deadly Decoy plugin. Thank you all for your feedback and uh, bug uh, notices as I was typing them. Um, and then we, we uh, released it to the world. So if you know any hunters or if you play any hunters, do uh, give it a try and see if you like it. Although you'll have to be playing Yellow Lion in the first place. And I know that's not everyone's uh, favorite, uh, but if you are a trapper of foes, give it a try. See, see if it helps you uh, be a little bit more precise with your decoys. Uh, yeah, Little Redhead likes that. She's Yellow Lion. <laughs> okay. Um, well, in that case, unless there's any last minute questions in chat, I think we are rapidly coming to the end of this stream. All right, I am not seeing anything trickling in. If you do have any questions and we didn't get to them or you wanna save them for next time, please do bring them along. Uh, I often try to do a, um, a general uh, a plan for, for what we're going to do, but I don't mind getting derailed at all. All right, well, that being said, I think that's all we're gonna go and cover today. Thank you for joining me on this exploration of literature plugins. I do hope to see you all next week, and until then, keep plugging along. Bye-bye now.